Take your Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of Acts. I suspect you were probably thinking I was going to say, take your Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Exodus. I, I am not done with that series. I have two more sermons that I want to preach to you from the events in the life of the nation of Israel uh, around uh, the things that happened around Mount Sinai, and I'll, I'll do that uh, beginning next Sunday and preach the last two sermons in that series. But I, I wanted to, to take today and talk about the life of Billy Graham with you. Uh, I, I just think there, his death, I'll get it out in a minute, is just incredibly important and something we need to think about. So I'm inviting your attention to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and I want us to read about what happened on the day of Pentecost, one of the greatest sermons ever preached in Bible times. We'll begin reading in verse 1. I'm uh, reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible, and you please follow along with whatever translation of God's Word that you have with you today. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Luke says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, and, and by the way, Pentecost was one of the three annual festivals when all Jews were expected to come and worship in Jerusalem. So when this sound occurred, the crowd, the crowd that was there to worship, came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing the, the apostles speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are, are not these who are speaking Galileans? How is it, verse 8, how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pont Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying one to another, what does this mean? We would say, what in the world is going on here? But others were mocking and saying, well, they're full of wine. Verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. I won't read the entire sermon to you, but would you turn the page probably and look at verse 37. I want you to see the aftermath. At the end of Peter's sermon, Luke says, Now when they had heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. 
And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost to a Jewish audience. The Spirit has come down. The church begins on that day. We think about the life of Billy Graham. That's, that's the passage I want you to have in front of you. You saw the news on Wednesday. Billy Graham died. He was 99 years old. And you probably heard it said by some news outlet somewhere that he had earned the title America's Pastor. And, and that is an appropriate title for him. He prayed and counseled with 12 American presidents, Republicans and Democrats alike, going all the way back to Harry Truman. When Bill Clinton's scandal broke, most of you remember that, Graham said it was a time for forgiveness. George W. Bush said it was a conversation with Billy Graham before he was elected that helped him decide to quit drinking and recommit his life to Christ. And unlike other well-known preachers like Baker and Swaggart, Graham's ministry was never tainted by moral scandals. And there was a reason for that. He didn't want that to happen. And he took a vow early in his ministry that he would never be alone with a woman who was not his wife. And I'm telling you that people appreciated his integrity. And that's why they came to hear him speak. That's why he drew, I think, part of the reason why he drew such large audiences. In 2005, a Gallup poll at that time said one in six Americans, and that, that works out to 35 million people at the time, that one in six Americans had heard Billy Graham preach in person. Altogether, since 1947, Billy Graham has preached 400 or so evangelistic crusades to roughly, uh, according to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, 215 million people. Now, let that number sink in. Told the kids, Library of Congress got 34 million books. But here's one man who in his lifetime has preached to over 200 million people the simple gospel message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. One man. And that doesn't even count, that number from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association doesn't even count radio, television, and internet. In 1873, the great evangelist D.L. Moody said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. Well, I'd like to tell you that I think Billy Graham came pretty close. But the, the death of Billy Graham is not just a time for us to reflect on how well he lived his life. That, that's not the reason I wanted to talk about Billy Graham with you today. The death of Billy Graham is a time for us as Christians to understand that we are now living in a new world. Do, do you get that? Do you hear what I'm saying? As of Wednesday, at roughly 7.30 in the morning, the world changed for us. Ken Ham and scholars like him have been talking about this for some time. I, I want you to hear what they've said. And they've phrased this mostly in terms of how the church will change. As of Wednesday, with the death of Billy Graham, the work of churches will change. Ken Ham said, on the day that Billy Graham dies, we will come to the end of the era in which sermons sound like Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. That, that's the sermon that 
we just read sort of because we didn't read the whole thing. But I want, I want you to think about what we did read. When Peter preached, Peter preached to his fellow Jews who were people who shared his belief in the one true God. They were people who shared his belief that the scriptures were the word of God. Go back to what I told you with the children, the word that we ought to be reading. Amen? Oh, that was sad. I'm, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just count that up as you listening to the rain instead of the sermon. Anybody buying that? Okay. And they were people who shared his belief in absolute truth. Now, if you notice in the little bit of the sermon that we read, Peter's sermon started by quoting the Old Testament prophet Joel. He started his sermon by saying that God said, I will pour out my spirit, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And then Peter talked about the cross and he called for repentance and lots of people responded. 3,000 in one day. And what Ken Ham and other scholars have said is that on the day that Billy Graham dies, the church will move out of that era and into a new era when sermons will sound less like Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and will sound more like sermons preached by Paul on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And I hope sometime maybe this afternoon or sometime during this week that you'll read, you'll go to Acts 17 and you'll read Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. I want to tell you something about that sermon. When Paul preached to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, he did not quote an Old Testament scripture. But instead he talked about the difference between a true God and a man-made idol. And he said that God does not dwell in temples that are made with human hands. And then he talked about the resurrection. And the Bible says that a few folks believed, but more did not. When Paul preached at Athens, he was preaching to people who did not share his belief that there is one true God. He was preaching to people who did not share his belief in the scriptures as the word of God. He was preaching to people who did not share his belief in absolute truth. And so what Ken Ham and others have been saying is, is that with the end of the life of Billy Graham, we're, we're moving into an era when the people that we preach to the people that we work with, the people that we witness to are, are not going to be so much people who go, oh yeah, I know that's right, that's what the Bible says. They're going to be more like people who haven't read the Bible, may not care about the Bible, and have no experience with church and just don't know the name of Jesus Christ. Our world is is changing. Now what Ken Ham and, and his scholar friends have said is mostly a conversation about church changes, but I want you to understand this morning that if church ministry is changing, if our context is changing, if the neighborhoods around us are changing, that means your personal ministry is changing too. And, and some of you at this moment may be saying, oh, wait, what? My, my, my personal what? Do you understand you all have personal ministries. All right, one more time. Right? <laughs> right? Every believer is a minister. Every believer is a minister. Does that hurt a little bit? Is that a little scary? You may not be the pastor. 
You may not be a deacon. You may not be a Sunday school teacher. But you are a minister. You are a representative of Jesus Christ to the people who know you, work with you, live with you, and that you meet on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the reason I want to talk about the life of Billy Graham this morning for just a minute. And I want to talk to you about what he did. I, I think, I really do think, that the life of Billy Graham was God's last gift to us before this new era really kicks into high gear. And I think he was on this earth to teach us something about how you and I must minister individually. Now, most of his ministry, was, yes, was on a big stage. But I think he also taught us some incredibly important lessons about how to work with people just in our everyday lives. So I, I want to tell you seven quick things. And, and right now somebody's going, seven points? Oh, my stars. We'll be here till 3 o'clock. I'm going to do this quick. There's a place in your bulletin for notes. I hope you'll write down seven just very brief things if you'd like to keep up. I want you to know. Number one, your ministry in this new world will require humility. One of the things that people loved about Billy Graham is that he never got the big head. A Scottish minister once said about Billy Graham, my first impression of the man was not of his good looks, but of his goodness, not of all of his speaking commitments, but of his commitment to Jesus. To be with him for even a short time was to get a sense of a single-minded man. Billy Graham was not a big shot. He was an ambassador for Christ. And that was true all the way to the end. I don't know if you saw it in the news, but I, th I thought it was significant that Billy Graham will be buried in a plywood coffin that was made by the inmates at Angola Prison in Louisiana. Not a big shot. He, he's not being buried in a beautiful coffin. He's being buried in a, in a plywood box. Now, it's got a nice stain on it. I saw a picture of it. They did a good job. Those are some interesting fellows, by the way. I, I used to teach a class at Angola. That's an interesting group of guys, and there's a great revival going on in that prison system. But I'll tell you, Billy Graham's going to be buried in a plywood coffin. To the end, he never wanted to be a big shot. He just wanted to tell people about Jesus. Number two, from the life of Billy Graham, learn this. You can't keep it to yourself. You cannot keep Jesus to yourself. If you want to be a minister of our risen Lord, at some point you have to take the critical step and talk to people about the gospel. Now, I'm not telling you that you walk up to a complete stranger and say, now you better get right with God. I mean, good morning first would be nice. But at some point in a relationship that you have with another person, if you want them to be in heaven with you, you've got to talk to them about the gospel. Franklin Graham has said, and I thought this was very telling, that after graduating from college, his life was a mess. He was empty. He was lonely. Billy and Miss Ruth took Franklin out for lunch for his 22nd birthday. And then Billy and Franklin took a walk. They were near a lake, and they were just walking around the lake. And Billy said, Franklin, your mother and I sense there's a struggle going on in your life. Franklin said, I was stunned and wondered to myself, how does he know this? Billy continued, he said, you're going to have to make a choice either to accept Christ or reject him. You cannot continue to play the middle ground. And then Billy said to his son, I want you to know that we're proud of you. We love you no matter what you do in life or where you go, but you're going to have to make a choice. Franklin said the words pricked his conscience so much that he was actually angry and stewed about the conversation for weeks until he finally gave up running from God and invited Jesus to be the Lord of his life. At some point, 
You have to talk to people about the gospel if you're going to be a representative of the kingdom. Number three, you have to get in the habit of seeing souls around you. Most of us are so busy that we get in our own private silos. But if you're going to learn anything from Billy Graham, you've got to learn that you have to look to see souls around you. Some of you may have heard this story. I think it's the best story I heard all week. Uh, they talked about it on the Rick and Bubba show this week. Uh, there was a, they were talking to a gentleman who was working with Billy Graham during one of the crusades. And at the time, Billy was older. And so during the invitation, people are coming to the altar. People are coming to the altar. People are coming to the altar. But Billy Graham's getting older, so he sat down. And it was what he had come to do. So he said, Billy and this other gentleman had sat down on a pew there in the front. And people are coming to the altar. And said, Billy Graham leaned over to him and said, you ever get a hangnail? And the guy thought, what? <laughs> he said, man, I got a hangnail the other day. It drove me crazy. And said, the man was thinking, well, that's it. He's getting older now. He's lost it. And he said, this thing was so bad, it was tearing into my skin. I, found, I had to go get a manicure. He said, I don't, I don't do that very often, but I had to go get a manicure. And the young lady that was doing my fingernail, I asked her if she went to church. And she said, no. I invited her to come to the crusade. And then he nudged the guy and he says, look, there she comes coming down the aisle to give her life to Jesus. He wasn't talking about hangnails. He's talking about souls. You, you can't get so busy that you forget that there are souls all around you. Number four. You need to understand that no believer is ever exempt from service. No believer at any time is ever exempt from evangelism and service. We all have a job to do. And, and you can reach people that I'll never reach. There's people that I can talk to that you may not be able to talk to. We're all of us involved in this and we're never exempt. Billy Graham stopped preaching in 2005, but he never officially retired. He, he would not take that title. He said the New Testament says nothing of apostles who retired and took it easy. And I'm telling you today, you, you need to get it in your mind that no matter where, no matter when, you've got work to do. Graham in his biography said that early on in his ministry especially, he preached in every cow path and wagon track. <laughs> I like that. Ministry happens in a lot of places. Ministry happens in here, yes. Sometimes ministry happens out in the vestibule after church. Sometimes ministry happens out on the parking lot. Sometimes ministry happens at your workplace. Sometimes ministry happens in your homes. Sometimes ministry happens over the back fence. You, you never go off duty. Number five. I told you I'd do this quick. Always leave room for God to teach you something new. Always leave room for God to teach you something new. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Graham said in his biography that as a young man, he hated going to church. Can you imagine that? He hated going to church. And then in 1954, he got saved. And that changed. God taught him something new. Number six, keep an end focus, E-N-D, Keep an end focus. In 1996, Billy and Ruth Graham received the Congressional Gold Medal for their lifetime of service. Here's what Billy Graham said about that. As Ruth and I received this award, we know that someday we will lay it at the feet of Jesus. Now that's what he thought about getting that big shiny gold medal. He said, one day I'll lay this at the feet of Jesus. In 2005, after he preached his very last crusade, a publisher released a book that had the complete text of the three sermons in that book. And they asked Billy Graham, 
Would you just write a, a, a little word for the, for the end of the book? It's going to go on the last page. Just a closing word after these three sermons. This is what Billy Graham wrote. No matter what your problem is, if you and I could sit down and talk, I would tell you one great truth. God loves you and He can make a difference in your life if you will let Him. God loves you so much that He sent His Son into the world to die for your sins. And when we open our hearts, He forgives our sins and comes to live within us by His Holy Spirit. He also gives us strength for the present and hope for the future. This is the message of the gospel. He's always thinking about what was going to happen in heaven. Keep and end focus. And see, we're already to number seven. This is the last point. And if you're listening carefully, you don't want to go out there anyway, do you? I can come up with three or four more if you want me to. Number seven. Now, what are we talking about? I'm telling you that every believer is a minister. That, that's what Billy Graham's life can teach us. If we'll look at him, we'll learn how we can serve as ministers in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And there's something for every one of us to do because the world is changing. Not everybody believes that they ought to be in church. America is not an unspiritual nation, but in America now, spirituality does not automatically start with Christianity. Folks are open to all sorts of things. So that's what we're talking about. Number seven. When you, be, when you serve, when you speak as a minister of the gospel, somebody won't like it. That's the last thing you need to know. Somebody won't like it. And what I'm telling you this morning is just get used to that idea. You might as well. Because you talk about Jesus somebody's not going to like it. Your job is not to be applauded. Your job is to do your job. And you think, well, wait a minute, now, now does this involve Billy Graham? Yes, it does. Well, you telling me somebody's complaining about Billy Graham? Yes, I am. Billy Graham died Wednesday morning about 7.30. By 4 p.m. that same day, the Washington Post, which in my humble estimation is barely a newspaper. Sorry, I'm getting political here. By 4 p.m., the Washington Post ran a story describing the problems that Billy Graham's children had with divorce and with drinking and suggested that his time away preaching was the root cause of their problems. That's Billy Graham. So eight hours after Billy Graham died, the Washington Post was tying it up with Billy Graham. There you go. Now that, that's not the worst of it. On the same day, that same day that Billy Graham died, former President Barack Obama, who everyone knows would have differences of opinion with Billy Graham, tweeted this message. He said, Billy Graham was a humble servant who prayed for so many and gave hope and guidance to generations of Americans. That was pretty nice. And then Mr. Obama was immediately trashed on social media. Immediately trashed on social media because he didn't say something negative about Graham because Graham had not approved the homosexual lifestyle. Now, you want to read it? Just Google it. But let me warn you before you Google it. The language is vile and despicable and incredible what people said on social media about Billy Graham. Somebody, you talk about Jesus, somebody's not going to like it. 
I just want you to know that. I want you to be prepared. Let me sum it all up for you. What I am telling you is what the Bible has said in one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are ambassadors for Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.20 says. We are ambassadors for Christ. And what I'm telling you this morning is we're living in a new world and that job just got harder. So what are you going to do about it? What I'm telling you to do about it is get with it. There's something for every one of us to do. Would you stand and pray?